All right, it is Wednesday night. It's a little bit after six and I promise you that the light will disappear soon. So this is actually working out for the average viewer and people here because uh, I can't get long winded. I already have my reading glasses on and I forgot my headlamp. There we are. So we're gonna get down to business. We're gonna be in Acts chapter 27. We're almost to the end of the book. Acts chapter 27 verses 14 through 26. And we're also gonna cover, if we can, verses 30 through 44. So there'll be verses that I point out that we're gonna hit specifically and then others that, that we'll, we'll probably gloss over a bit here and there. But nonetheless, Paul is going to Rome. He's going to be shipwrecked and he never looks for a way out. And so tonight, the, the title of the lesson is called Focus. Focus. So um, I did include some other reading and I'll get that out of the way so that I don't forget to give it to you. If you wanna just kind of read along other areas of the Bible that may expand on this idea, you can check out Proverbs chapters 19 and 20, 1 Kings chapter 12, and Exodus 8 and 9, all right? So tonight, three points we're going to cover. One, we must keep the mission in sight. We must keep the mission in sight. Point two, like I said, I got daylight leaving, so I'm going to hustle a little bit here. Speak peace in desperate times. Be decisive. And what I mean by that is, peace is a decision. You have to decide that it can exist within you and around you, no matter what the circumstances may hold, no matter what people may be saying, you have the opportunity to embrace peace in each and every season, all right? And the focus must be Christ continually. Point three, quote unquote, all right? So start with a quote. The proof, end quote, is for the glory of God alone. The proof, quote unquote, is for the glory of God alone. And this is a reminder, no matter the circumstance, no matter the trial, no matter the tribulation, no matter the opportunity where you could receive glory or receive honor, remember in each and every one of those seasons that no matter the outcome, that you live in such a fashion that God is glorified. If your actions lead to recognition in front of men, give God glory. Never attempt to take what belongs to God. If he gives it to you, which Jesus says he will, then you have the opportunity in that moment to be exalted in the eyes of men so that God will be exalted in the eyes of all. All right? So let's dig into the lesson. Grab your Bible, Acts 27, verse 1. I can do this. Don't think I can't. Now, when it, I get the same way when I'm hungry. You can ask Angela. I'm like, food. Now, when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, they proceeded to turn Paul and some other prisoners over to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And we boarded... Don't even think I'm going to try to say that word. A drama shien, a drama shien, ship that was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia. And we put out to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus of Macedonia of Thessalonica. Verse 3, the next day we put, out, put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friend's and receive care. Verse 4, for there, um, from there we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus. So you get the idea of where they're headed. Let's move over to verse 14. But before long, a very long and violent wind called a that rushed down from the land. And when the ship was caught in it, and could not head up into the wind. We gave up and let ourselves be driven by the wind. Running under the shelter of the small island called Kata, 
we were able to get the ship's boat under control only with difficulty. Verse 7, after they had hoisted it up, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship and fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Citrus or Cy Sardis. They let down the sea anchor and let themselves be driven along in the way. Verse 18, the next day, as we were being violently tossed by the storm, they began to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small storm was assailing us, from then on, all hope of our being saved was slowly abandoned. Verse 21, when many had lost their appetites, Here's where we're talking about focus. Paul then stood among them and said, Men, you should have followed my advice and not have set sail for Crete, and thereby spared yourself this damage and loss. And yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night an angel of the, of the God to whom I belong whom I serve, came to me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has graciously granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore keep up your courage, men, for I believe that God, that I believe God, that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on a certain island. So point one. We must keep the mission in sight. Paul was not looking for a way out. He knew what was coming and the fact that he was going to go to Caesar, that there was going to be trial, that there were going to be circumstances. I don't, I don't think initially he saw the end of all things, which, which comes. But nonetheless, God had foreordained that this was going to occur and that Paul was going to set a saint, an example before all men any any authority if you will was going to take notice of what it was that he was doing and going to do and the message that he was bringing remember paul was innocent of the charges against him but his appeal to caesar is what sent him to caesar and as we had read last week if he had not he probably would have just been released but god had ordained that he was going to go into the halls of the powers that be at that time. I mean, Rome held everything with an iron fist. So we must keep the mission in sight. Paul's peace allowed him to advise with clarity. Now, there is an I told you so. Paul said, I told you guys not to go this way. I told you not to do this. But nonetheless, he was right. And there are some times in our lives that an I told you so seems to come at the wrong time because we're exhausted, we're irritated, we're aggravated, and we clearly understand that we made the wrong decision. But here's what's interesting in about an I told you so. If you're humble, when you hear an I told you so, it calls you to the moment that you made the decision to recognize the pattern. What was it that was going on at that point in time in my mind and in my heart that made me or drove me to make this particular decision? Now, for those men sailing the ship, they were going a standard route. They were going the way they knew and understood. And Paul's like, let's not do this. Let's go this other way. And there are times in our walk in Christ, somebody's going to come along and say, hey, you need to think about this differently than you are. There's another direction you need to go. There's another line of thinking you need to have. And so we're faced with the choice. Which of the two will we embrace? Because when somebody gives you direction, to head another way and say, I think this would be best, and we don't pray about it, we've turned it down without ever giving it a second thought. One second here. It's a Chrysler. It's making noise. All right. If you drive a Chrysler, no offense. It's just that one was making noise. But nonetheless, when we get into those seasons, why are we quick to make choices against counsel? It's because we don't have within us the ability either to take advice or to take counsel or we're already offended. So that's why we drive to that one decision or that one thing 
And how many times have we done that? That's what asking about the pattern we're in. How many times have we done that? Because behavior is cyclical. Hurried and anger, angry hearts do not recognize the obvious. All right? They do not recognize the obvious. Well, why is this the way it is? It's obvious. Do not... I know there's sometimes we talk about spiritual matters, that there's another layer to things, and it takes time to see that. But there are some things that are on its face. They are what they are. Very rarely do I get into, you know, I don't, I don't teach a lot trying to reconnect. Um, there are going to be decisions you're going to have to make about things that are in your history that can't stay anymore. Like they have to go. Maybe it's people, maybe it's, it's habits, history, you name it, they have to go. And don't be afraid of that. Do not be afraid of that. It'd be di very difficult for a bunch of sailors to take advice from a prisoner. But Paul gets to the end of this and says, what? I told you. I told you. And then what does he begin to speak? Courage into them. Knowledge comes to the wise. Knowledge comes to the ones that are focused on peace. And our perception must be controlled by Christ. If you look at Proverbs Chapter 14, 11 through 15 says, The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Even in laughter, the heart may be in pain, and the end of joy may be grief. Verse 14, The backslider in heart will have his fill of his own way, but a good man will be satisfied with his. Verse 15, the naive believes everything, but the sensible man does what? Considers his steps. Point two tonight, speak peace in desperate times. If you look at Paul's point in verse 21, he says, when many had lost, or Luke writes, when many had lost their appetites, Paul then stood among them and said, men, you should have followed my advice and not set sail from Crete and thereby spared yourselves the damage and loss. When you get down to verse 25, he says, therefore keep up your courage. Why, does, why is it important for Paul to tell them, say, hey, in advance, I knew this was gonna happen. So in advance, I'm gonna tell you again, in advance, take courage. We're gonna lose the ship, but everybody will be alive. You're like, but we're going to lose the ship. Yes, but nobody's going to die. All right, we can get another ship. There are going to be times and maybe in your, your, your progression and faith that God's going to give you a word and it's ignored. I've, tell, I've told you before, there's sometimes you have meetings, you're not sure what's the point. Well, the point is just to get some things on record. Maybe that meeting so that another person expresses all the anger and irritation that's in their heart. And you come to another point in time where you still love them and are able to say, hey, so how'd that go? Not because you're wanting to rub it in their face, but because it opens a conversation so that they can be free of a pattern that has harmed them and those that they love. Trust me, confrontation is difficult, but sometimes people think that compassionate people never confront. Cruel people never confront. Compassionate people truly do confront out of love. They see a behavior that's out of line and will cause injury and they say something. That's love in action. Love is willing to risk a relationship. It just is, all right? If we don't risk relationship for the sake of truth, then everything's just about us. Point two, speak peace in desperate times, be decisive. The quote unquote, I told you so can hurt but it gives direction and it allows us to reflect. The message of the Lord was Paul's hope. Paul heard what God said and he gave that to these men. Take courage, I need you to eat, I need you to get ready. We are gonna run aground. We're gonna run aground on a certain island, but nobody's gonna die. We're all going to be here. We're all going to be there. Now here's the interesting thing. This is all proved true. This is all proved true. So Paul's message was not for the destruction of his captors, but actually for their rescue. Why? Because everything he needed came from Christ. And this would be the question for us. If we need our enemies destroyed to be happy, 
are we truly loving people? It's true that I desire to see justice done, but if just the, if I can't be loving or have the joy of the Lord because I haven't seen my interpretation of justice carried out, then do I have a relationship with Christ? Do I have a love in my heart for the things he loves? Because he was willing to come and die for us, and he did. And so by doing so, he removed from us, if we're willing to accept his covering and his lead, the consequences of sins we committed. What are we willing to do? What are we willing to cover? How far are we willing to go to do the work that Christ has called us to do? All right? It may not, and it probably won't be easy, but it's absolutely worth it. So our message is not for the destruction of our captors or our enemies. In fact, we, we bless those who curse us. The sailors had to remain. They had to remain. If you look at verse 31, skipping down. If you're wondering where it is, it's after verse 30. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men remain on the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes and the ship's boat and let it fall away. Guess what? People begin to listen when you speak hope. All right? It's interesting when you're right. When these guys sailed out, when, when, when situations start, everything seems to be status quo. Everything seems to be the same. And somebody comes along and says, hey, this is probably going to be different. You might want to get ready. No, 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 no. Come on. And we rationalize it away. Peter talks about the very same thing, that people will go along, all right, just as they were in the days of Noah, all right, partying, giving in marriage, doing whatever they're doing, and then what happens? Then destruction comes. Then, then issues befall us. It's the same thing. Human behavior has not changed. We don't want things to change. In fact, when they do too fast, what do we do? We buy a bunch of toilet paper we don't need. <laughs> I mean, I, I still don't understand I don't that. Either. Toilet paper, guys. You guys went for toilet paper, not, not canned food and bullets and supplies and toilet paper. <laughs> toilet paper. Maybe we need to start teaching survivalist that stuff in class, be, you know? A maybe a maybe a whole thing, thing on it. Yeah, that'd be one Royal of the last Rangers. things I pick, Dang. all right? <laughs> Good grief. Proverbs 25, 21 through 22. I'll read it to you. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Verse 22, for you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. Last point. Verses 39 through 44. The, the proof, quote unquote, is for the glory of God alone. Verse 39, before the light leaves. It is. Now when the day came, they could not recognize the land, but they did not notice a bay with a beach, and they resolved to run the ship, but they did notice a bay with a beach, excuse me, and they resolved to run the ship onto it if they could. And casting off the anchors, they let them in the sea while the, at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudder. And they hoisted the foresail to the wind and were heading for the beach. But they struck a reef where two seas met and ran the ship aground. And the plow stuck firmly re and remained immovable while the stern started to break up due to the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the, pr kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from accomplishing their intention and commanded that those who could swim were to jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest were to follow, some on planks and others on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they all were brought safely I'll lose right to land. The proof is for the glory of God alone. We are blessed to know the plans of God. 
We are rewarded for obedience. We are blessed to know the plans of God. We are rewarded for obedience. Rescue is the product of God's goodness. Participate, don't own, and I'll explain what that means. When God uses you, it is exactly that. He is using you. When we are obedient, we're like, Lord, use us. And then we face difficult times. That's kind of a funny moment, right, to get mad. What's going on? I'm using you. You said you wanted to accomplish things for me. Read the Bible. It, it, I never said it was easy. Here we go. Buckle up. And when God does it, don't own it. Give God glory in each and every one of those seasons because the glory of men will never bring about what the glory of God will. It'll never happen. If you're seeking the glory of men, you will be constantly disappointed. If you're seeking the glory of God, you'll be tested and pushed by this world. Remember, God does not tempt, nor, does, nor is he tempted. But you're going to be pushed. But it's going to be worth it. When we release praise, we are protected from compromise. When we want glory, compromise will come. When we praise God in the midst of those, even those that we've rescued, even whatever it is, we give God praise, it keeps us from becoming proud and missing the opportunity to gain God's favor and be rewarded. 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 through 25. Here we go. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deception, found, deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he, up, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him, capital H, who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. Verse 25. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Remember, God is very much interested in covering you and protecting you. But it takes obedience to get there. It takes obedience to remain. And that's the point that Peter was making. For a time, you were straying like sheep. You were gone into dangerous places. You were defenseless. And that's why we're often referred to as sheep. I've, I've never seen one armed for battle that was really threatening. Without Christ, we are exposed to every form of darkness. We are faced with every opposition and powerless to change it. But in Christ... We're more than conquerors. In Christ, we're more than able. And the world's definition of victory is not the definitions Christians should carry. Our definition of victory is freedom from sin and glory in God. That's it. And you accomplish that, you've accomplished it all. So slow down this week. Take a minute to pray through things. If God is revealing patterns of behavior that need to go, don't be afraid. You're not going to lose who you are. You're going to lose what was trying to kill you. Remember, he loves you. And I am certain of this, that if you walk according to his will, your soul will prosper. Remember, you're being prayed for and that uh, you truly are loved. Hope to see you soon. Thanks.